almost two millennia ago. A ship set sail on the Mediterranean Sea with nearly 300 souls on board. That ship never reached its destination. What should have been a routine journey to Rome along the coast of Asia ended in disaster. What happened along the way changed history. 2,000 years later, one man's quest to find that shipwreck could change history again. I'm Chuck Holton. As a war correspondent, I spend months out of every year in Afghanistan reporting on the troops. The Marines here say it's like fighting your way through the Old Testament because the way of life has changed so little in the shadow of the Hindu Kush. But I recently had a different kind of adventure on a small island in the Mediterranean called Malta. And what I learned there brought me closer to the Bible in a way that a trip to the war zone never could. And I think it'll do the same for you. The year was 65 AD. The Apostle Paul was a marked man, imprisoned by the Romans, accused of blasphemy by the Jews. Paul had already spent two years in prison and survived several attempts on his life. A Roman citizen by birth, Paul appealed his case to Caesar himself and so was sent to Rome under the watchful eye of a centurion named Julius, where his fate would be decided once and for all. They made it to Myra, and though the winter was closing in, the centurion found a large Alexandrian grain freighter bound for Rome and booked passage for his party. They sailed with difficulty to the Isle of Crete. Paul's advice was to winter there, but the centurion decided instead to continue toward Rome. It was a mistake that nearly cost him his life. Today the storm would be known as a nor'easter. Back in the first century they called it a gregal. But whatever the name, the storm that hit the freighter after it left Crete was a sailor's worst nightmare. Nearly 2,000 years later, the mystery that began with that storm surfaced again with an explorer named Bob Cornuk. Like the investigators on the hit show CSI, Cornuk was once a crime scene investigator in California. Today, he's the founder of the Bible Archaeology Search and Exploration Institute. For more than 20 years, he's used the skills he learned solving crimes to unravel mysteries of the Bible. He's explored various theories about the lost Ark of the Covenant, searched for the true location of Mount Sinai, and investigated claims about the existence of Noah's Ark. I just happened upon the search for Paul's shipwreck by accident. I was, uh, it was involving a, a shipwreck of my own over in Ethiopia on a, on a remote lake, very large lake and we were rescued at night. It was a pretty harrowing experience. And so as I started reading about Paul and his journey and the shipwreck. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were approaching land. They took soundings and found the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and found it was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. And I looked at the Bible and said, could I solve this like it was a crime? Could I take the evidence that exists on the pages of the Bible and go over and find the evidence that exists in archaeology and the topography and in the history of Malta and actually find these lost anchors that the Bible talks about? And so I came to Malta and I started my journey. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea. And in Malta, the shipwreck of Paul is very important to people. They venerate, they, they honor their festivals, their belief system is really very much immersed 
in the story of Paul and Paul coming to this island and the shipwreck of Paul. We don't know how the tradition started of the shipwreck by the Maltese that it was on the northern part of the island. We know that it's been around for about 800 years. Maltese tradition holds that Paul's shipwreck occurred on that island right over there in what's now known as St. Paul's Bay on the northwestern side of the island. Thousands of tourists come here every year to visit the site and a chapel was built nearby to commemorate the event. But there's only one problem. Very little about this area matches the biblical account. So Bob knew he had to find a different site if he was going to find the true location of Paul's shipwreck. But Cornuk believed the truth could be found by simply following the clues laid out in Scripture. The Bible is the ultimate authority. The Bible is the source of truth. Jesus talking to the Sadducees in Mark 7, 13 says, hey, your traditions will nullify the Word of God. In other words, if we start following man's traditions and not the Bible, we're going to run into problems. The reformers used to use the term, a uh, Latin term called afuantes, which means go to the source, to get the answers to all these mysteries of the Bible. Bob surmised that the four anchors might hold the key to unraveling the mystery of where Paul's ship actually ran aground nearly 2,000 years ago. People say, well, anchors would dissolve and they're made out of wood. They are made out of wood, but there's a lead stock, kind of like the cross that you see in a Navy insignia, that, that crossbar is solid lead and it's very resilient in salt water and would last a long time, certainly 2,000, maybe three, four, five thousand years. But these anchors would survive in salt water. When I read all the details in the Bible, I remember saying to myself, could these anchors possibly be found today? The search and rescue service in Malta has a great reputation for rescuing sailors lost in the Mediterranean. We are using software here that can calculate drift of a, any search object. You define what is the search object. And the Bible says that they were, the sailors were worried about striking this part of Africa, the Sirtis. For periods of two days at a time, we have drifted the object, taking consideration the kind of weather, described in the Bible, and surprisingly, even to me, they ended up in Malta, exactly as the Bible says. And his jaw dropped and he said, look, the ship landed on the coast of Malta on the 14th night about midnight, according to the computer, which is exactly what the Bible said. And it landed right in the southeast quadrant of Malta. That's where the drift would have taken it, which means it could not have gone to the traditional side. If the ship made landfall somewhere on the southeast coast of Malta, as the computer projected, it would be a major breakthrough for Bob's search for the anchors. Further confirmation of the evidence came from Dr. Graham Hutt, the man who literally wrote the book on Mediterranean storms. I've been studying the storms and the weather patterns in the Mediterranean over the past 30 years. This is a storm that can last anything up to 10 days normally. Although there are some periods of time when it's been a lot longer than that. Bearing in mind that they were heading in a northwesterly direction. They were coming round the island of Crete and were due to head up, heading up for Rome. And it says that they set off and they had a southerly wind, which would have been absolutely perfect. But it didn't take long before that turned and became a northeasterly. And that was very much against the, uh, the direction that they wanted to go. Not directly against it, but it meant that they couldn't, they couldn't go with their square sails, which really are best suited for going downwind. And they were really scared of getting dragged down into the Bay of Sirti, uh, down on the Libyan coast, because it's a uh, big, long sandbanks down there. And the last thing they wanted to do was get down there. So they would have been trying as much as they could to head in a northerly direction, but only actually making northwesterly, which gave them a passage more or less to the, uh, up to the coast of Malta. Cornuke began searching for a likely bay on the southeast coast of Malta that fit the biblical narrative. He started with the people who knew the coastline best, the Maltese fishermen. The local fishermen out here are very colorful. They, they take these very colorful boats out there and they fish in the early mornings and the late evenings. So what I did is I started my search by going out with these fishermen. They knew the weather, knew the currents, knew the topography of the ocean. They took me out with them and they explained to me all the possible places based on what the Bible narrative says to where the shipwreck of Paul could have been. 
The more Bob dug into the mystery surrounding the shipwreck, the more people he met who had a similar interest in finding the actual place where the Roman freighter ran aground. One of those people was James Mulholland, a longtime member of the St. Paul's Shipwreck Church in Valletta. So you must have one, 120 feet and 90 feet of water. So the West Coast is out of question. It's all over 200 feet, the West Coast. So it's based on the East Coast, it's a must. And we have five major bays, five major. We've got the Meliha Bay, we've got Salina Bay, Baluta Bay, St. George's Bay, and we've got St. Thomas's Bay. Narrowing down the most likely spot took looking for clues in the Book of Acts. As the, the, the dawn broke, they did not recognize the land. Now, that's the most interesting thing. They didn't know where they were and they didn't recognize the shore. They would have recognized it up in the north because that's where many ships went. Malta was like O'Hare Airport is today, of course, in the United States. It was well visited by all these sailors and so they would have been there probably many times. And Luke is commenting, the sailors are saying they don't recognize this island even after they landed there, which means they landed on a part of the island where they, the sailors had never even seen which should be consistent with the southeast coast of Malta, where they would not have gone. And as the ship is going towards the coast, it encounters this reef where two seas come together. Luke describes it this way. He says, tapon de thalosan, a Greek word meaning where two seas come together. We read that the, the seas met, two seas met. So we get these contrary currents and big seas rising up. No. One that says, we need a bay with a reef. There must be a reef. But Luke writes more than the reef. He says, our ship hit between two seas. It's a long, long tongue coming out. The two seas are meeting this, this, this land coming out. Now, it means two seas are meeting each other. That is only two places. So really, the only candidate that makes sense, this is Archaeology 101, that it should be the Munshaw Reef on St. Thomas Bay. Clearly, clearly, this is the place that it should be according to all the factors that the Bible gives us. We're here at St. Thomas Bay and the Munshaw Reef is right behind me. And even on a calm day like today, you can see where the two seas come together, the two currents meet above the reef. And that's a telling clue that this is the place where the shipwreck could have happened. The only place to find 120 feet to 90 feet, a reef, a place with two seas, not a harbor, and no identification, you start eliminating one by one, you finish up with one bay. And that is St. Thomas's Bay. With all the clues pointing to the Bay of St. Thomas, Bob decided it was time to get wet. Diving is an age-old sport in Malta. Before the invention of scuba in the 1950s, skin divers fished the plentiful waters around the island for centuries, using rudimentary masks and homemade spears. Lifelong diver Wilfred Parada remembers those days. I have been diving since I was 12 years old. Now I'm 73, and I started diving Without mask or anything in my days, I used to dive for sea urchins. And then as uh, years went by, I, I used to make diving masks as well out of the inner tube of a car. I cut it into shape and uh, then cut a glass to put around it, either a round one or an oval one. You put this on like this. We used to tie it with a strap at the back. And uh, of course, when you go down, because the uh, rubber is not thick enough, it, it, with the pressure, it used to come right into your nose like this. But then you blow out and it, you, you keep it. Because in those days, we couldn't go down very deep as uh, we didn't have any nose and any, you couldn't pinch your nose, you couldn't blow because of the pressure you have on you. And uh, then I made a, uh, a harpoon gun which I made my, myself out of a long piece of wood. Then after that, we used to catch a lot. So, I mean, you can't keep them all at home. So we used to sell them. 
Wilfred Pratt is considered the grandfather of all scuba divers on Malta. He knows more than just about anybody on the history of diving and the bottom of the ocean in Malta. Prior to 1956, I mean, you couldn't go down very deep. When I say uh, I used to go down 90 feet, that is uh, later on, Jacques Cousteau invented these diving cylinders and uh, we tried to make something look like it. Even with crude homemade equipment, the new technology enabled divers in Malta to reach depths below 60 feet that prior to the 1950s would have been unthinkable. This advancement opened up a whole new world of undersea exploration. In the deep, you can come across many things, like amphoras, lead anchors. You can, can even come across a, a sunken ship or something. Bob searched out some Maltese divers who would be able to tell him what the seafloor looked like around the Moonshar Reef. What they told him was almost too incredible to believe. After a year's research, I finally come to the conclusion that they had to have been, these anchors had to have been in St. Thomas Bay. And so I went looking for a diver to help me out. And I found a man named Ray Chancho, who was probably the most uh, well-known diver diving on the island at that time. And he said, hey, Bob, in the late 60s and early 70s, we dug up four anchors from the ocean bottom. And uh, we were diving here a good while ago. This is Moonshar Reef, which I mean, it's, it's an extension of those rocks over there. As I say, I was born around this area. And the, uh, the currents on the reef are very, very strong, very strong. Um, when, if I'm now there with a boat at sea in a storm, this is one place I do not want to be. Cornuke no, explained side, yeah. his theory about no. St. Thomas Bay yeah, and his intention way, yeah. to search the seafloor for the anchors from the ancient shipwreck. Yeah. But oh, Ray's oh, answer oh, gave Bob the shock of his life. They, when the divers told me that they had found anchors in the, in the ocean bottom exactly where the Bible said, where I thought that they should be, I, I was stunned. And then they turned the ship, the Bible says, and they came up and they hit an island called Malta. If you take that course in that direction, you land right at this point here, right at the southeast point of St. Thomas Bay. And interestingly enough, four anchors were found in the water here at the exact depth the Bible says. Four anchors, all found in 90 feet of water within a few meters of where Bob had surmised they would be. Could they be the lost anchors of Paul? Before he could answer that question, he had to see them for himself. Of course, when I found out that they brought up the anchors, I said, where are they? And I was stunned to find out that they had uh, brought them up with lift bags and taken them ashore and put them in the back of their trunks of their cars and they carted them off to their homes. So we had uh, 45 gallon bottles when they carried the oil in to bring it up. We found the anchors. Uh, at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, I wouldn't remember the exact year, you know. As I say, it was of no importance to me whatsoever when I found them. It was EFA, you found a piece of lead. Ray introduced Bob to a whole group of divers who had helped recover the anchors from Moonshar Reef. One name in particular kept coming up, that of the diver who found the first anchor. His name was Tony McAuliffe Borg and Bob knew Tony would be the key to tracking down where the four anchors had ended up. There was only one problem. Tony had been dead for almost 30 years. Tony McAuliffe Borg was the hero of all divers on the, on, the, on the island. In the pecking order of divers, he was numero uno. He was the top guy. And everybody looked up to Tony. Oh, we met um, one evening, one summer evening. It was the 28th of July, 1959. We, I was walking with my friend along the front. It's, uh, that was the fashion in those days in summer, you know, when it's very hot. And uh, he stopped to talk to my friend. And uh, he was looking for a friend of his. He had to meet him, but he never showed up. So we started, you know, walking up and down. And um, then my friend had to go home early because at the time we had to have, uh, we used to have a curfew, you know, <laughs> you can't stay later than nine o'clock. And then he asked me, he asked me for a date. <laughs> I remember I met Tony at one of these athletic meetings. I was a teacher, he was a teacher. Joe Navarro was the fun-loving one of the group, and 
they went down spear fishing, and Joe was right there when they found one of the anchors and brought it up. First, we started snorkeling together, but he said, we'll start fishing together so you don't get into problems. I was a feeble looking guy compared with him, he's a big man. They called us the underwater cowboys. Later on, the two men started a diving club called Cresta Key, where they would spend their summers training divers in the nascent art of scuba. Charlie Vela was a teenager at the time who got a summer job at Cresta Key. I was about 15, 16 at the time, still at school. Tony was my physical training teacher and that's how I got going. They were both located by Tony himself. You need to have a very good keen eye for this kind of thing because of the marine growth and whatever, they seem to blend in with the rest of the stuff. As fishermen, these divers spent lots of time underwater, scouring reefs for fish they could sell to local restaurants. And that's how Tony McAuliffe Borg made what may have been his most valuable find ever. Tony told me, Joe, I need your help because I found an anchor and we want to bring it up. I said, fair enough, Tony. So off we went. It wasn't a very nice day because I have dived so many times with Tony, but I must say that the, the time we brought up that anchor, it gave us so many problems. I always said to myself, there is something tied up with this thing. You, you say to yourself, but what am I doing? But this could be, you know, something, a treasure. You know it's not something that you normally find on the bottom. There must be some value here. But this time, it was, it was tough, even to bring it out. We had lifting bags, we had these drums, oil drums, then you just take your DV out, put air into it. Uh, first, you, you start seeing a rumble. Then it tears itself from the bottom, and it starts floating slowly up. I tell you, when this thing came up, and I looked up at it going, my goodness, thank you, here. it's like fireworks in the festa, you know? <laughs> While the men were out diving that day, Tony's wife, Margaret, was at the dive shop, minding the store. And I was left at Krastaki, as usual, <laughs> tending the, the compressor, filling the tanks. All of a sudden, the weather started getting very, 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 very bad, and it was getting darker, and, and, and the swells were getting bigger, and it, they, they didn't return at the usual time. When they, you know, there was normally by four o'clock, all the divers are in, you know? and uh, I started getting worried. So I contacted the, the petrol boat to see if, uh, if they could find them or something like that. Apparently they had this anchor and they had to hide it from the petrol boat, you know. And um, it remained there at the store for several years. And it was a Roman anchor, so it was important. But I, I, I never, never imagined it was you know, possibly. one of the anchors yeah, from yeah. possibly. Yeah. Before long, Tony spotted a second anchor, very close to where the first one had been found. And the second one, the particular interest of the second one was that because it was broken. And obviously it was, it was broken because there was some real brute force being put onto it. In full size, it was like something like this. And it was cut right where the center wood piece would fit just off of that. In those days, lead was a very valuable commodity. And since the second anchor had been broken in half, Tony decided to melt it down and use it to make dive weights for his shop. Because it was broken, it didn't have that much real value, history-wise. So Tony took the decision to uh, melt this thing down. Terrible mistake, obviously. Over time, two additional anchors were brought up from the site. All were found on the outside of the Moonshar Reef in about 90 feet of water. It's very good being a reef, so it was very good for uh, fishing. And that's what we used to go down there for. We found these two, and we know other people that have found a couple more from the same area. These anchors were found, interestingly enough, right off of this point here, and, and all of the physical descriptions given in the Bible, all of them, come together right here in a unique, very powerful way. Tony and his friends continued diving and spearfishing the waters around Malta, never knowing what they might have found. The anchors made their way to the various homes of the divers who found them, and they could have easily remained in obscurity forever. Just before Christmas in 1978, Tony McAuliffe Borg decided to go spearfishing one afternoon. 
Sadly, it would be the last dive he would ever make. He went diving and he never turned up. It just, he just stayed down and, and then we started the search, but we, we couldn't find him. It took us seven years. It, it was probably a heart failure or something. A remarkable, I, I, I miss him. He, he, he's, he's been gone for a long time, Tony, but I still miss him to this very day as if, you know, I lost him yesterday. Great buddies, we were great buddies. I think all my life is my fondest memory of Tony. There is no, no particular moment, but we were very close. We used to do everything together. They never even thought for a moment that these could be Paul Shipwreck's anchors when they were young men. They had always been taught that it was on the other side of the island, at the traditional site. Tradition is so strong in history. And when I read through the Bible and I gave them the list of all the things that the Bible says as to where it should be, it was like a light went on in their minds. And they said, you know, we believe we could have actually been a part of a great discovery. It's a big thing, it's a big thing. If uh, when one thinks, listen, St. Paul, and you have touched the anchor that he might have touched too, being Maltese, you say to yourself, well, I'm not doing too badly after all. This, this is a milestone. I couldn't at first understand all the excitement about it. And I said, it's just a, a plain anchor, you know. And, and then eventually um, Bob uh, started telling me their theory. And immediately I saw the reason behind it, you know, that it could be a possibility. I don't think we'll ever manage to say 100% that this is them, but I think we're very close. And uh, it does justify what's written in the, in, in the Bible definitely feels exceptionally good to be part of history and what it symbolizes. I don't think it makes sense to think that St. Paul had to go all the way up the island to get shipwrecked. If you're coming from the direction he was coming from, you get shipwrecked on the first shore that you meet. One thing is sure, when it was established that St. Paul was shipwrecked on St. Paul's islands, Nobody went diving to see the bottom of the sea. The theory that it could have happened further south um, is um, also confirmed by, by diving experts. There are more facts that can be proven maybe with time. Perhaps I am, I am over romantic about these things, but I think it's about time we got a bit romantic about some things. We are bathed in history. Why not this one? It took Bob several years to track down all four anchors. This is it. It's the fourth anchor. We've been looking for this for two years. But the story doesn't end there. It was a crime to even bring up something from the ocean bottom. And once I told him that these anchors could actually be from Paul Shipwreck, it created a whole new set of problems. By working closely with the Maritime Museum here in Valletta and with the Maltese government, Bob was able to secure amnesty for the divers, who then turned the anchors over to the museum. And though the curators there acknowledged that the anchors were from the Roman era, so far they refused to recognize the potential importance of the find. The strength of Maltese tradition has proven almost impenetrable. But since Bob's book about the shipwreck theory was published several years ago, more of the residents of this Mediterranean isle are starting to come around. One of them is Douglas Gresham, a Maltese resident whose famous stepfather is known around the world as C.S. Lewis. I'm fascinated by the whole idea that we now know, I think, where Paul came ashore. There's so much evidence. I used to get all excited about the fact that you can, you can go to St. Paul's Bay and look out on St. Paul's Island and think that's where he actually came ashore. So when somebody in New Zealand, funnily enough, a New Zealand broadcaster said, look, I've just come across a book you have to read, and sent me a copy of Bob Cornuke's book, um, The Lost Shipwreck of St. Paul. I thought I was going to be hearing all about how he came ashore on St. Paul's Island and so forth. Started to read this thing and became fascinated. So the more I got into it, the more I thought, this guy knows what he's doing. And because it wasn't until later I found out that Bob had in fact been a police officer and, and, and uh, pretty elevated one of that by my standards and a detective and so on. But he presents the case for his theory of where Paul actually came, came ashore 
not as some kind of wishy-washy, uh, this would be nice sort of thing, but, but with straight investigative detail. One after the other, the points are raised. Everything is tracked down to the ultimate nth degree until you, you realize that all the evidence is in fact there. That St. Paul's Bay is not where St. Paul came ashore. Um, it did in fact come ashore just over there, according to the theory. And I think it's probably accurate because the evidence is so powerful. When I used to testify in high profile cases, I never had this much evidence. This, this evidence is just overwhelming. In fact, I believe you'd have to force feed your mind past reason and logic not to accept this site. It's like Luke was leaving us a treasure map for someone to follow. I mean, it's so detailed when other parts, we don't even know anything about the other shipwrecks Paul was on. The anchors were there and the right amount at the right depth and the, before the bay with the beach where the two seas meet and the reef was at the right depth. But the degrees of probability are so overwhelming that these, these are the anchors from Paul's shipwreck. These could be the first objects that are man-made, that are mentioned in the Bible, that we have found through research in archaeology. It just really, uh, really enhanced my faith in a very unique way, and I'm, I'm just honored to be a part of it. You know, archaeology does not prove or disprove the Bible. Archaeology illuminates truths that are already there, and I hope that people use this as a tool that will help them in their search for truth and their search for God. For me, finding the anchors is not just an archaeological find. It's not just an adventurous discovery. For me, they're a symbol of hope. Today, the anchors found off the Moonshar Reef occupy a dusty corner of the Maritime Museum in Valletta, along with other Roman anchors from the same period. There's no way to know if they are indeed the anchors from the most famous shipwreck in Malta's history. But the facts uncovered in Bob's research lead many to conclude that St. Thomas Bay is the most likely site of Paul's shipwreck. And the four anchors retrieved from the site could be the only man-made artifacts specifically mentioned in the New Testament that still exist today.